I'd like to get started. And thank you for coming this evening. I want to thank our speakers off the bat and thank everybody who's showing up here this evening. Um, on behalf of the Radnor League of Women Voters, uh, I'd like to welcome you here this evening. My name is Jenny Kreitler. I'm a member of the Radnor League. Um, we are doing this program this evening. Uh, it's meant to be an informational program on outdoor lighting issues and municipal ordinances. And uh, we hope you find the presentations informative and helpful to you. The League decided to host this um, discussion this evening as part of our work to inform the public on issues which we have, through consensus, taken a League position on. The League has a long-standing position on land use which states that we shall monitor and examine activities in the township pertaining to zoning and planning. And many of you know, issues related to outdoor lighting have emerged repeatedly over the past several years as new and expanded developments um, have been proposed or approved. This evening's event was thus designed by the League to educate the public on the practical, legal, and health impacts of outdoor lighting. Um, before I introduce our speakers, I want to go over the logistics for this evening. We're going to have our three speakers give their prepared remarks first, and then we will have time for questions and answers. The way that we're going to uh, handle the questions and answers is the same way that we do when we host a forum for uh, electoral candidates uh, running for office. And what we do is we provide uh, paper and pencil for you to write down your comments, then I'll ask you to if you have a question that you want asked of the speakers, to turn your um, piece of paper in to one of our league volunteers who's here for that purpose. Uh, we have a few ladies who will be uh, doing that. Ladies, do you want to stand up and raise your hand so people will know yeah, you are designated comment <laughs> recipient here? Okay. They'll be circulating around, and you'll see that they're coming, and that's the, the reason for that. So um, given the time available at the end, we will try to direct questions to all of the speakers and ask as many of the questions as we can that we get from the audience. Um, with that, I'm going to um, tell you a little bit about our three speakers and then let them get going. We're going to first hear from someone who makes lighting decisions for a facility and uh, can give you a perspective about the considerations and the process involved with that. Then we're going to have an expert on um, chronobiology matters, which has to do with how light affects um, the biology of human beings. And our third speaker will speak to us about um, good lighting practices, how lighting technology has changed, and municipal ordinance options. So if Radnor Township decides to move ahead uh, to enact a new ordinance to address outdoor lighting, he'll speak to some of the options that um, are available to the township. So our first speaker will be Mary Lou Smith. She is a senior project manager in the facilities management office at Villanova University. A Villanova graduate, she holds a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering. She is a LEED certified um, professional and has over 35 years of experience in design, construction, and project management. Mary Lou has managed a wide range of projects for the university, including the construction of the Structural Engineering Teaching and Research Laboratory, Driscoll Hall, uh, a 200,000 square foot renovation to the Mendel Hall Science Building as well. Currently, she is the senior project manager on the project that is transforming the university main parking lots along Lancaster Avenue into a new living and learning environment that includes student housing, a performing arts center, a pedestrian bridge, and new and expanded parking facilities. Our second speaker is Donald McEachran. He's a teaching professor in the School of Biomedical Engineering Science and Health Systems at Drexel University. Trained as a neuroscientist, his primary biomedical research has focused on chronobiology, biological rhythms, and human performance engineering. He has published a book on the topic of chronobioengineering and is working with his Drexel colleagues from the School of Civil and Architectural Engineering and the College of Nursing and Health Professions to develop new lighting systems which optimize light intensities, wavelengths, and timing. 
In addition to his work at Drexel, he has served as chair of the Engineering and Biology and Medicine Society, Philadelphia chapter, Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, Philadelphia section, and fellow and founding member of the International Behavioral Neuroscience Society. His work in chronobiology led to his being selected as the January Man of the Month 2015 by Disruptive Women in Healthcare. I want to meet those women. <laughs> Our third and final speaker is Stan Stubbe, of, uh, who has worked in the lighting industry for over 50 years in roles including sales design and consulting. He is a member of the Pennsylvania Outdoor Lighting Council on whose behalf he is speaking this evening. This council promotes responsible lighting through education. Mr. Stubbe is also a member of several other professional lighting organizations, including he's a life member of the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, member of the International Commission on Illumination, a member emeritus of Illuminating Engineering Society, and a member of its Outdoor Environmental Lighting Committee. He is the owner of Stubbe Consulting LLC and provides consulting services to 18 municipalities in southeastern Pennsylvania, advising on appropriate lighting ordinance language, reviewing outdoor lighting submissions received by municipalities from applicants for lighting ordinance compliance, and conducting post-installation inspections for compliance with approved plan commitments. So I hope you will um, get a lot out of uh, what they bring to the uh, evening's discussions. I think they have a lot of expertise on this subject. I am going to step away from the podium now and ask our first speaker, Mary Lou from Villanova, to come up and give her give her a perspective on how lighting decisions are made. Thanks, Jenny. Thank you for having Villanova here to represent or to talk to you about this. Um, so. Uh, not only have I been working for 35 years in this industry, uh, for the first 13 years I was in design for lighting and power systems for an engineering firm. So I have a little experience as well in designing lighting for outdoor as well as indoor facilities. Um, now I just manage construction projects. So when Villanova starts a project, uh, you know, we identify something that needs to be done and the first thing we're going to do is we hire a design team. And today, electrical engineers don't really do the lighting designs anymore. What we do is we have lighting specialists or consultants that are hired and uh, they guide us in this path of designing lighting. Um, so uh, primary focus for us is uh, we have to, you know, They'll follow the IES guidelines as well as the township ordinances. Um, and, and the most important thing is they look out for the safety of our students as well as the public. Because we're really a public facility. It's not just about Villanova students. It's everyone that comes to and from Villanova University. So um, lighting, I feel like, has changed a lot in the last 20 to 25 years. It used to be that you lit sidewalks so you didn't trip and fall. But today, you light sidewalks and parking lots and facilities outside for safety features as well. So when you're, you're walking, you want to be able to identify someone that you're, you're walking to. So it's, it's more about uniformity versus spotlighting. Um, it's not just about tripping and falling. It's more about knowing who's approaching you, so, uh, which the light levels have increased significantly since, you know, when I did this in my first 13 years of my 35-year-old or 35-year profession. Um, so, you know, what used to be like a half a foot, foot candle that you were looking for, now it looks like we're, you know, we're anywhere from one to two foot candles of light that is being spread out, so it's a much more uniform path. Um, so, again, that's one of our primary focuses. Uh, the different projects that we would do on campus and the way we look at different things. So if we're doing a walkway or, um, or just a site lighting, we try to also be, uh, to pick fixtures that fit with Villanova University. So if you look at a lot of our fixtures, they're gothic, uh, they're black gothic fixtures. And uh, the first set of fixtures, our older fixtures are um, more, uh, they're a cutoff fixture that is about 80% dark, dark sky compliant. 
Now, they didn't have dark sky compliant 20, 25 years ago when we started to put these fixtures in, but we put these fixtures in because we have an astronomy department which you know, didn't want to have light in the sky. So we changed our lighting then to these, full, what at the time were a full cutoff fixture. Now there's fixtures, uh, the surface lot we just put in for the Lancaster Avenue um, development, they're 98% dark sky compliant, actually 99.6% dark sky compliant. And um, so they're not shedding any light up high, however, they're, they're focusing the light down. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, hold on a second. <laughs> you know how the apple just dies for you? Um, We, uh, we've done a few garages recently. So anytime we're looking at a new project, we try to do what is the latest and greatest in, uh, in technology as well as controls. Um, however, we don't want to get ahead of ourselves either. About six to, maybe six to seven years ago, we looked at uh, doing something with our lighting at the stadium. And at that time, LED lighting was kind of a, a new technology for stadium fields. And uh, not everyone was using it. It was discussed with us with you know, different vendors. And even they didn't recommend that we, we be the guinea pigs on this. So we continued with the fixtures that we had and tried to put controls on them so that we can control when they come on and off. Uh, LED lighting has improved immensely over the last seven to 10 years. And um, you know now it, it's very directional. We have it in our garages, in two new garages. Uh, along with controls with that. So uh, in our latest garage that we just put up, uh, we have motion detectors. So it, you know, if no cars are driving around after a certain time, the lights will go to half. Uh, and we also have some timing controls in there as well that they'll reduce in the light levels. Um, we will not shut them off though. It, you know, that to us is not a safe feature. We have to keep lighting on in case someone is in the garage. Um, so, uh, so we have, and in garage lighting, uh, you'll find that even if you drive by, you'll see at our entrances, they seem very bright. But um, what I've been told from lighting experts and consultants is that you want to have that as a higher foot candle level as you're entering in a garage versus when you're, once you're in the garage. And um, so we take our lead from our experts. There are our engineers, our designers. Uh, we will challenge them every once in a while if we think something is, you know, too much. But uh, again, we try to to follow their lead. They're they're guiding us. They're the experts in this. Um, and then uh, so and the other thing would be our sports lighting. So whenever we do a new field, uh, which I believe we just did one in Conshohocken, not here, but we did one in Conshohocken, which is using LED lights and uh, the controls for that. And as we do new projects, we try to do what is the right lighting for that project. Um, and the controls that we use, we try very hard to use photo cells for our outdoor lighting uh, and timers as well. And more now, we're getting into the motion detection, which we had never done before, but that's kind of a, a newer technology that is um, it's, it's working well for us. I mean, we use it in all of our facilities for occupancy sensors and uh, vacancy sensors in our dorm rooms. Um, that's pretty much how we kind of make decisions on the lighting, if anyone has any questions or... Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. Sure. Okay, I teach a two-term sequence in this material at Drexel, so condensing this to 10 minutes may seem a bit quick. Uh, we'll see how, how well I can do with this. I just happen to like this picture since this is Kronos, the Greek god of time, where my field gets its name, chronobiology. Uh, this is a claim that I think I can show, um, hopefully a little bit tonight, 
that timing really is everything. I deal with biological rhythms, and biological rhythms are a critical component of all living systems, humans and all other organisms. Uh, the implications are that if you disrupt the rhythmic organization of a living system, it's likely to have poor or deleterious effects on that system. We all know what happens if there is an interference with the rhythm of the heart. Uh, I happen to have three cardiac stents. I can personally testify that screwing up that rhythm hurts. Um, but I'm going to contend that there are a lot of other rhythms that are part of the living systems that can also be disrupted. And although the effect may take longer to show up, it is also damaging. It's also true that the effect of an environmental variable or factors such as light on an organism is going to depend on the time at which that variable is exposed to the organism. So some of the frequencies of rhythms that are operating in your body as you sit there include nerve cell activity that runs at milliseconds. Your heart is about eight-tenths of a second. Metabolic cycles, hormone secretion, the non-REM REM cycle. Hopefully you're not asleep at the moment, so you're not really in that cycle right now. There's a 24-hour circadian cycle that affects sleep-wake, and I'm going to hopefully be able to demonstrate that it affects absolutely everything else as well. There are uh, estrous cycles in various mammals. There's the 28-day menstrual cycle. There is, in fact, a very significant yearly cycle in uh, suicides and births in human beings that still exists. Um, and you can all the way go to ecological cycles that last multiple years. We're going to focus on this one uh, tonight because of its effect on light. Uh, I really didn't have to show this, this slide. I just happened to like it. Um, it shows the difference between light and dark across the Earth. Lots of things change on the Earth due to light and dark. Temperature, humidity, all kinds of characteristics. And this has been going on for about uh, two billion years at this level or so. And life has evolved to deal with these light-dark cycles. Human beings are evolved organisms. And we carry inside of us our evolutionary history. And one aspect of that is that we, too, react to light-dark cycles. I assume that if I were to ask you what body temperature was, everybody would give me 98.6, right? That's body temperature, 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. And if you answered that, you'd be right twice a day. The rest of the time, you would be wrong, because in fact, body temperature goes through a 24-hour pattern, a circadian rhythm. So if you look at actual recording of body temperature, you discover it's only there at 98.6, or 37 degrees C, twice a day. Here we have two other rhythms. This is one in a hormone called melatonin you may have heard of. This stands for dim light melatonin onset. This is very important because if you do not have dim light, you do not have dim light melatonin onset, and there are consequences to that. This is a rhythm in cortisol. There are rhythms in every parameter, every aspect of your body. Here, we're looking at that melatonin rhythm. The higher rhythms are younger people. The lower rhythms are what happened as you age, so your melatonin cycle becomes uh, less powerful. It has a lower amplitude. It can be suppressed more easily as you age. Everything has a rhythm. I'll give you one example. You think of heart rate as being, what, 60, 70 beats a minute. If you exercise, it's higher. If you rest, it's lower. Except there's a 24-hour pattern in heart rate. And this is controlled in part by your circadian clock. So 20% of the human population shows something called non-dipping. Most of us, when we lie down and go to sleep, our heart rate goes down. All of us in physiology used to think this was because you were laying down. Makes sense, right? Your heart doesn't have to work as hard. 
except apparently there's a circadian clock in the heart itself. And that helps to control whether or not that heart rate goes down when you go to sleep. For that 20% that don't show this dip, they're called non-dippers, they have an increased risk of heart attack because they don't show that rhythm. Again, to show you some examples, I don't know, does anyone suffer from allergies or asthma in here? All right, so if you look at this particular rhythm, these are rhythms in respiratory function. If you look here, this is a rhythm in plasma histamine. And if you have allergies, you often take antihistamines. You want to block the action of histamine. But histamine's a natural chemical. It peaks at four in the morning. If some of you have severe allergies, you might have at some point had to use an EpiPen, all right, for anaphylactic shock. That's epinephrine. Notice that the body's epinephrine decreases and reaches a trough at four in the morning. So histamine goes up, epinephrine goes down. When do you think asthma attacks peak? Four in the morning. All right. Nor is that the only thing that shows this kind of rhythm. Heart attacks peak at around 10 in the morning. This is the effect of daylight savings time. Now, daylight savings time seems like a minor shift in your rhythms, right? You're only moving an hour. You spring ahead by one hour. Except, if you look at this, what you discover is that there is a statistically significant increase in heart attack around the daylight savings time, time shift. Some people calculate the risk goes up for vulnerable individuals 25%, simply because you lose that hour. You have shifted your rhythms by an hour, and it puts you at enormous risk. So what are we talking about here? We're talking a little bit about light pollution. And if you look at this satellite view, you can give some idea of what we mean by light pollution. This, of course, is our personal version of light pollution. I have to talk to my students about this all the time. This is enough light coming out of an iPad to suppress melatonin secretion at night and change your biological rhythms. So from the point of view of healthcare and how humans work, what are the implications? Activities or schedules that disrupt rhythms will impair health. Disease processes may disrupt rhythms themselves, and treatment of diseases and physiological control, uh, insults will require rhythms to some degree. If you want to prevent disease, you want to ensure temporal health. You keep the body in tune. Most of you go and you have your vehicles tuned. Part of that process is to regulate the timing. Well, cars and vehicles are trivial organizations compared to your body. If you need to keep your car in tune, how much more important is it to keep your body in tune? All right. Irregular schedules, inappropriate environmental signals can disrupt internal temporal order. So some of the issues that have been shown from rhythm disruption, from shift work and jet lag, we've linked Rhythm disruption to cardiovascular problems, gastrointestinal disorders, psychiatric disorders, breast cancer, and sleep disorders. So much so that the American Medical Association in 2012 declared artificial lighting to be a public health problem. Here are some of the things we've seen. Abnormal disrupted sleep, reproductive problems, infertility, gastrointestinal issues, ulcer development, the development of diabetes, increased cardiovascular risk, increased risk for breast, prostate, and skin cancer, decreased performance, productivity, depressed mood, increased neuropsychological issues, increased suicide risk, all from rhythm disruption. And what's one good way to disrupt your rhythms? Inappropriate lighting. Light at night will help disrupt your rhythms, and therefore increase your risk for this entire list of categories. This has gotten so bad that the International Agency of Research on Cancer has actually listed shift work as a carcinogen. 
So what is the, the issue? This is a cartoon, if you'll forgive me, of how your human system is put together. You have a, a dark, light dark cycle. It synchronizes a master clock. And this master clock synchronizes a group of secondary clocks. As long as this is all coordinated, you have temporal hygiene, and your body functions as it evolved to function. As soon as you disrupt this, that desynchronizes, and the entire system degrades. All right, where do you get the light? You get the light in human beings and mammals entirely through the eye. Artificial versus natural lighting shows significant differences. All right, natural lighting goes to about 10 to the minus 4 lux at night to between 30,000 and 130,000 at midday, or nine, 6 to 9 orders of magnitude. Artificial varies, but seldom do you get dark. If, if none of you have been out in the, the woods in rural Pennsylvania recently, you don't know dark. All right? You can't get dark in the Philadelphia area. All you get is dim. So the difference now is that there's only about two to three orders magnitude shift between light and dark. And the natural pattern is gradual onset and offset. Artificial, not only is it highly variable, it's not even predictable. The timing, gradual changes over the season, again, artificial, abrupt, and often unpredictable changes. Even the wavelengths are not quite the same. This represents the daylight spectrum. This is an incandescent spectrum. One of the interesting things about the circadian system is that it shows a maximum sensitivity to light at about 480 nanometers. In other words, it responds to blue-green light. Notice you can see all the way into the red. But the red has almost no effect, or at least we thought it used, had no effect, on the circadian clock. So it's possible, at least we think it's possible, to design lighting systems where you can see, but you are not disrupting the circadian clock. How much time have I got left at this point? Like 30 seconds? I have a minute. Oh, cool. All right. So, Desynchronization is a lack of entrainment or synchronization to environmental cycles. That's external desynchronization. If your internal clocks aren't synchronized to each other, that's called internal desynchronization. Rapidly changing or inappropriate lighting can result in both external and internal desynchronization. And in that case, your risk for almost everything goes up. Cardiovascular, gastrointestinal, sleep disorders, memory problems, everything. It's hard for people like me to, to give people like you the appropriate recommendation on lighting at this point, because we still don't quite understand all of how lighting works in human beings. All right, We're still trying to figure it out. Turns out your eyes have circadian clocks. Your eyes are not the same sensitivity to light at different times of day. They have their own clocks running. As you age, it changes considerably. All right? So I'm out of time now. So I'll be happy to answer any questions anybody has um, after our final speaker. Last speaker this evening is here from the Pennsylvania Outdoor Lighting Council. Stan Stubbe has been working in this field for quite a long time and with many municipalities in Pennsylvania. So he can speak to both some of the trends that we're seeing going on with the technology and how municipalities can address lighting through the ordinance writing process. Stan. Uh, let me see, Barry, you may have to help me bring up the slides here. Okay. 
Kitty, next time I want to be on before Don, not after him. He's, <laughs> he's too good. I think those are forward and back. Yeah, there you go. Okay. All right. Yeah, we're going to talk now a little bit about uh, putting s more responsibility on uh, the municipality to write an ordinance that's understandable and effective. And uh, <clears throat> one of the issues we're going to be talking about is, is uh, not by name, but circadian rhythm and the impact on, on human health. Um, let me see how we doing here. That's not working. Well, why doesn't this work? Let me put it that way. Doesn't want to talk to me. Okay. Okay, here we go. So these are some of the municipalities uh, with whom we have worked uh, to write uh, effective lighting ordinances. Uh, and the main takeaways tonight are, are going to be uh, the LED uh, revolution, uh, and uh, why townships, and in particular Radnor Township, uh, needs to consider uh, writing an ordinance, uh, updating their ordinance to, to respond uh, to the issues uh, with LED lighting. Uh, and we're going to get a little bit specific about some of the main uh, issues that need to be included in the ordinance. So. Uh, one might ask, well, wh what's, why do we need to even worry about lighting? Uh, and, and in this slide, we suggest that uh, we are enhancing safety and security and providing visibility to see at night. <clears throat> uh, and uh, so the, the, the goals of good outdoor lighting uh, are to uh, provide for uh, safety uh, and being able to work effectively, but doing so with uh, minimum glare, minimum light trespass on other people's uh, homes and in their windows, uh, minimizing the impact on natural environment. And this is something that is kind of a hard sell. But the fact of the matter is that uh, more than 50% of God's creatures uh, live and eat uh, at night in darkness. And when they don't get that darkness, they become uh, uh, attacked. Pre I can't think of the word <laughs> predation, something like that. Anyway. Uh, and uh, as Don has already so aptly observed, that uh, uh, lights at night can have a dramatic effect on, on people's health in the short and long term. So what we're calling the, the LED revolution is indeed a revolution. Uh, I'm sure all of you have changed your 60 watt light bulbs to a four or six watt LED at home. Uh, and it, it, they're such a wonderful power saving as an example, uh, but they do have their drawbacks and they can be significant drawbacks. And we, uh, we feel that municipalities cannot use their old traditional lighting ordinance to provide for their citizens' health, safety, and welfare uh, the, the kind of lighting uh, that's necessary without, uh, but, but that th they can't get without uh, upgrading the ordinance. I'm not sure I did very well at that. Okay, so a municipality that hasn't updated their ordinance uh, is probably in uh, for some problems. So the good news about LEDs is that they have a much lower power consumption, as, as uh, you all, I'm sure, have uh, experienced. 
Uh, because their light distribution uh, is superior, uh, you often don't have to use as many lights. Uh, and uh, we're hoping that the maintenance costs uh, of LEDs are, are going to be significantly less. We know that they last for 100,000 hours or, or more, at least advertised. But there are some unknowns with LEDs uh, that have not yet uh, surfaced sufficiently for uh, us to be worried about them. Color shift is one thing. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, the electronics uh, can be very vulnerable. And that, that can be expensive to, to replace. Uh, and one of the most significant things, uh, and as Don uh, alluded to, uh, is the ability to dim and to uh, turn the lights off and, and then have them come back on uh, immediately. With uh, metal halide, you, if you shut them off, they had to cool down and restart and wouldn't start for 15 minutes or come up to full intensity. <clears throat> with LEDs, instant restart, great thing. It, it, it uh, uh, promotes the use of uh, dimming and uh, motion control, as previously mentioned. All right, so uh, th they can certainly produce a disabling glare. And I don't know if any of you have experienced that. Uh, it can be a hazard. Uh, I don't know if you've seen any of the new LED billboards where uh, they're so bright and so distracting that uh, they can be dangerous. Uh, okay, and uh, as also alluded to a little bit here, or a lot, was uh, there is a portion of the population that's extremely sensitive to, uh, to glare. Uh, and uh, the color temperature of the LEDs make those people uh, even more sensitive. Uh, we talked about the, uh, the blue part of the spectrum. And LEDs have a, a good chunk of that. And uh, it can be extremely annoying. Any, any of you in here? Uh, particularly sensitive to glare or know people who are, yeah. It, 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 it's, a, it's a bad, very, very bad thing. Uh, and, and it can be annoying and it can be dangerous. Yeah, well, here she is. Uh, because LEDs uh, use so much less power than the old traditional sources, people say, yeah, I'll leave them on all night. But then we have the, the consequences of nuisance to neighbors and, and, and the natural uh, environment consequences. Uh, one of the things we haven't experienced yet, but I suspect we are, uh, is that we used to have to change the light sources, the bulbs on our street lights, as an example, very frequently. And when we did that, we cleaned out the, the fixtures at, at the same time. If we're talking 100,000 hours, uh, this could very likely, depending upon fixture design, uh, be a lot of dirt accumulation in these fixtures to the point where maybe they're not going to be providing the safe light level that was intended. Uh, okay, so we've already talked about the brightness, the glare. Uh, the lighting affects the quality of life in, in the community, <clears throat> and uh, that quality of life can be uh, decreased by LEDs. Uh, and uh, we, we like to caution townships that if you monkey around too long with uh, de developing a, a new ordinance, upgrading, uh, if a, an application comes in, you're going to have to use your old, antiquated, inadequate ordinance to control that lighting because uh, unless your ordinance has been passed, uh, it's, it's not the one that's in effect uh, when that, when that uh, 
application comes in. So what do we want in the ordinance? Uh, we want uh, the old traditional requirement for uh, IESNA lighting levels uh, in, in order to be safe, uh, th that is the right amount of light, uh, that the lighting be what we call full cutoff, that is basically uh, no light above a horizontal, so it's not going up into the sky. And uh, in some cases with LEDs in particular, and this is probably more than most of you care to, to, to hear, but uh, let's do it anyway. Uh, some LEDs have a very, very high light output, not at 90, but between 85 and 90 degrees, so like right there, uh, and, and it nails you right in your eyes. And, and, and it can be extremely annoying. It can really mess up your, your safe driving. Uh, and, and so in some instances, we need to put requirements in the ordinance to control that very high angle uh, uh, light output. So here's a, an example of uncontrolled glare. We've probably all seen uh, versions of that. So, uh, one of the things we try to uh, achieve uh, is that they don't put these fixtures up at 50 and 60 feet in the air, uh, it, it, unless it's an extremely large parking lot, but, but for most uh, commercial lighting, 20 feet in the air is, is quite plenty. Uh, protection of light poles from backing vehicles, like uh, pickup trucks, and uh, mandatory shutoff hours at some time in the night when, uh, when the lighting is no longer needed or if it's uh, uh, like a bank where they have a drive-through all night uh, to perhaps put the lighting on motion and uh, uh, thereby not having it wasted. And I, I, I remember somebody talking about uh, at an ATM machine uh, the thief uh, is standing in the dark and you, the victim, are totally well lighted. So uh, see about how dark, uh, how safe that is. Uh, w w all too often we see uh, contractors doing their own thing and they put stuff up and they don't get permission to do it the municipality doesn't have the option, the opportunity to look and see, is this going to work or isn't it going to work? Um, and w so we require uh, notes be put on the lighting plan that puts them on, puts the contractor on record uh, as uh, having a responsibility. Then there's the big issue, well, what are we going to do about the existing lighting when it's converted over to LED because it's not the existing lighting anymore. It's a whole new thing. Uh, more often than not, with uh, glare to spare, and it can be uh, very dangerous to, to drivers. Uh, let's see. Yeah, we don't just want to look at the uh, parking lot lighting. We want to look at the building mounted lighting or anything that's outside that, that can cause glare. Cause glare. Uh, I don't know if we want to get into color temperature, correlated color temperature. Uh, what, what we find is that uh, the higher correlated color temperatures of uh, uh, 4,000 degrees Kelvin uh, in LEDs can be very, very bright. And so what we uh, are recommending is that for uh, residential applications that the street lighting uh, be no more than 2,700 degrees Kelvin. And that needs to be put uh, in the ordinance. It needs to be a requirement. And 
3,000 degrees Kelvin for commercial and industrial applications. Uh, already mentioned uh, dimming, turning lights off uh, when, when businesses are, are closed, uh, no need to have them on all night. Limiting light trespass onto a residential property to, uh, to a reasonable level, uh, a tenth or, 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 20, or 0.1 or 0.2 foot candles. Uh, and let me see, oh yeah, I mentioned uh, billboards. Uh, has anybody experienced an LED billboard, uh, w what you're up against? Uh, you will, the, the, it'll be memorable. They can be very, very distracting. This message uh, uh, is changing very frequently every 10 seconds or something like that. You're looking at the message instead of at the cars uh, on the road, very bad. Uh, okay, so where should it be put? And this is, I'm sure, is way outside of your uh, uh, area of concern, but Suffice it to say that we recommend that it be in the zoning ordinance uh, uh, w w where it uh, gets used and, and, and maintained. Just a couple words on, on LED sports. I had an opportunity recently to visit a new LED sports lighting uh, facility, that is to say, a, a, a an athletic field that was uh, relighted with LEDs. Uh, and I was impressed uh, with the fact that the lighting control was considerably better than the old HID metal halide sources. However, uh, the color temperature of the sources was uh, 5,000 degrees Kelvin and they were bright. Uh, the control, the aiming of the lighting was very good, but so much light bounced off of the field and went on the surface of the playing surface and went straight up into the air that it lit up uh, uh, the residential uh, homes uh, around it. Uh, so, so here, here are some, some workarounds that, that, that if you are going to uh, light the fields that uh, you, you require that they uh, be shut off when they're not needed, that they uh, be dimmed when uh, the playing is not going on and so forth. And finally, and very, very critical, uh, is uh, the, the need to enforce. Uh, and <clears throat> if, if you write a nice ordinance but you don't enforce it, you wasted your time. Uh, and uh, part of that enforcement is to uh, uh, conduct uh, a post-installation inspection of the lighting is everything the way it was supposed to be. Mounting heights, aiming, um, protection from tree uh, blockage, uh, poles protected uh, from backing vehicles, and so forth. I don't know whether Radner does that, but it, it really needs to be done. Um, this is a touchy issue, but I, I experience so often uh, where a, uh, a resident uh, comes to me and says, I went to the township and I told them that I had very, very invasive lighting that shines in my bedroom window all night, and uh, what are you going to do about it? And of course, we, we know that uh, the, uh, one of the main uh, jo jobs, if I could call it that, uh, of a municipality is to protect the health, safety, and welfare of its citizens. And clearly, uh, light shining in a bedroom window all night uh, 
just ain't good for your health, as we say. Uh, one of the problems is that uh, a young punk from the township goes out and looks at the lighting, and I don't see nothing wrong here. What's the matter? It looks great. Yeah, but the young punk has no sensitivity to glare whatsoever. And these folks may be up in years, they may have health problems, uh, and they just don't get any protection from the township. So, conclusion, get started. Uh, if you wait, you're gonna be out of luck. Uh, and keep it simple. Uh, I saw a, uh, uh, an early version of a proposed update to uh, the township's ordinance, and, and, and it was a, a, a scientific treatise on lighting. It was absolutely amazing uh, the detail into which this thing went in explaining what everything is. Uh, to the point where you get bogged down, you say, I don't know. I'll do my thing. Um, okay, and don't let this happen, or this. And we'd be glad to help you uh, craft a, a good, solid lighting ordinance. And here's our contact information. And uh, if you would like a copy of the PowerPoint, glad to email it to you. Would there be any questions? Oh, that's coming next. Okay. Yeah. That was very good. Did I do Appreciate it in time? That. You're good. Very good. Um, we're going to do Q&A, so if you have questions you'd like to pass forward, please do so. Also know that there will be a video of tonight's uh, presentations posted online. You'll be able to link to it from the league's website and I believe from the township's website as well. Um, we should have that up on our website in a couple days, hopefully. I'm not responsible, so I don't want to commit anybody, but uh, I think it should be quickly. So. Um, Bertie, you have more questions? Yeah, bring them. I'm going to start with a question to Stan. I know you did touch on this twice in your presentation, but um, I want to ask this question. It came in before this evening even got underway, and it has to do with how to address existing facilities, knowing that we will be um, possibly creating a new ordinance, is there any way over time to address existing facilities that had come in under previous standing ordinances? Is there any way to deal with that? Well, certainly there is, there is a way to deal with it, uh, and, and that is for the municipality, the township. What's the matter? Okay, thank you. Uh, the, uh, the township uh, needs, to, when they receive a complaint, they need to uh, visit the site and see what's going on. Uh, does it meet ordinance requirements or doesn't it? Uh, is it a health, safety, and welfare issue? Is there way too much glare? Uh, is it underlighted? And, and, and if those uh, things are, are, are the case, they need to do something about it. Um, is that starters. Stay here for a second. I have one more question for you. Um, one slide of yours mentioned uh, sunset provisions as uh, grandfathering for nonconforming uses. What is your experience with those type of provisions and the constitutionality of ex post facto zoning, zoning ordinances? So similar, <laughs> similar kind of concern. What are you talking about? Uh, okay, uh, as far as sunset is concerned, uh, I, I would say this, that um, it doesn't happen very often, uh, and it's less likely to happen if a citizen doesn't uh, make a complaint to the municipality or to the township and, and uh, uh, insist upon uh, some kind of uh, remedial action. Uh, I, I, I think the first thing we need to start with is uh, protecting against the glare and ill effects of, of LED lighting. Uh, but uh, uh, over time, uh, working on other uh, 
uh, invasive lighting uh, is something that should be done. I don't know if that answers that question or not. Where, where did you go? I'm right here. Uh, thank you for giving it a shot. Next questions are for Mary Lou. Um, does Villanova, so there's a theme running through some of these here. Does Villanova have any plans to revisit replacement of the stadium lights? And if so, when and, well, and estimated costs. But I think the bigger question is, are there plans and how soon might we see something like that? Uh, I, don't, I don't know the answer to that question. Question number two. <laughs> uh, what is the footlight requirement for use of the football stadium? IES, NCAA, something else? Uh, for the stadium, it would be NCAA standards. So for football, um, if it was televised, I believe it's 125 foot candles. If it isn't televised, it's 100 foot candles. And when you're looking at a high school football field like Nishamity, it's 50 foot candles. So it's drastically different for a collegiate field. That's good information. Professor, we have a couple questions for you. The first one is not on lighting, but does relate to our township's police staff who work 12-hour shifts. And uh, change today, night, uh, oh, sorry, John, I can't read this. Anyway, is there any way? To Swing shifts. Is there any way to mitigate the effects of the scheduling? There are ways. Uh, probably the worst thing you can do is continually shift back and forth from one schedule to another because your body never quite gets back into sync. Um, but suppose you are going from day shift to night shift. Um, you want a fair amount of lighting at night, right? So in this case, your blue light is a good thing. And um, the more reasonable exposure you can get at night, the better. The problem is that you come off shift, you walk outside, and it's sunrise, it's 8 in the morning. Believe it or not, you can help that by wearing red sunglasses. Um, by decreasing the amount of blue light that reaches your eyes, uh, try and when you get home, if at all possible, uh, get into a dark room, try and, and get yourself to sleep as, as quickly as you can. It is extremely hard, uh, but you can reduce the impact somewhat that way. Uh, the other thing you can do is if you can shift for, say, uh, three or four days at a time rather than like two-day shifts, you're a little bit better off because you can resync. All right. Okay. Thank you. And there's another question for you. This has more to do with indoor light exposure. And the question is, has the increase in flat screen TVs versus uh, cathode ray televisions caused more problems? Yes. Yes. Basically, yes. <laughs> um, the, the types of devices now from flat screen TVs to this thing. All right, you pull this iPhone out, you turn it on, and it glares. It's got a, a really quite powerful amount of light. So people have looked at, at iPads, which have a lot less of that blue light than comes off of a flat screen TV. 20 minutes of exposure to an iPad is enough to significantly suppress melatonin, decrease your subjective sense of sleepiness, and make it extremely hard to go back to sleep. Recommendation. I know nobody's going to do this, but I'm, I'm sort of compelled to tell you how you can help. Believe it or not, those red sunglasses may work if you just wear them a couple hours before you go to sleep. But the more blue light sources you use, the closer to the time you sleep. You remember I said that, that thing called dim light melatonin onset? You noticed that the melatonin came up gradually? If you're watching um, one of those bright uh, flat screen TVs, you don't have them in dim light melatonin on set. You've suppressed melatonin all the way to the point where you turn the set off. And your melatonin doesn't get a chance to get up as high. It doesn't, it, your sleep is a little less fulfilling. It's not like you don't go to sleep at all, but it's harder to go to sleep. Your sleep is, is less 
quality. Uh, it's less deep. Uh, melatonin has other effects. It stimulates your immune system. So if you don't have as much melatonin, your immune system doesn't work as well. Um, and melatonin helps synchronize your circadian rhythms. So if you have less melatonin, your rhythms don't work as well. So yeah, it, it costs you. Thank Does you. that mean you don't want to use that television ever? No, but if you can not use it as close to when you want to go to sleep, as you, know, you don't watch it and then turn it off and then try to go to sleep, if you could turn it off like an hour or two in advance and like read a book, you'd be much better off. Thank you. Uh, next questions, we'll go back to Stan. Um, there's um, a question here. I'd like you to speak to uh, residential lighting, floodlights mounted on a house, pointing outward from the property. Um, uh, if you could say anything uh, about that. And there's a second question, which I think is related, uh, asking about are there any resources on uh, lighting trespass? Well, of course, lighting trespass can be more of an issue when it's uh, light shining into somebody's bedroom window, and, and that's a no-no. And that's, again, a health, safety, and welfare issue, and it should not be allowed. But I don't know why uh, I, I hear so many cases of, of uh, people complaining uh, of uh, glare from a neighbor's poorly aimed light, uh, and, and there are there are um, uh, what do I want to say? Uh, there are metrics for uh, the angle that you should put your floodlight. Uh, but but the point is that if you go to your neighbor and you say your damn light shining in my window all night long, the neighbor's going to say tough luck, you know, I need my security, or I don't say they're always going to say that, but they can. That's when the township needs to step in and say, look it, aim that light down. Shut it off when it's not being used. You know, uh, light at night uh, actually makes it safer for, uh, for criminals. Uh, because they can hide in the shadows. And there are statistics uh, that indicate that, uh, uh, that that's true, uh, that uh, th there is more crime uh, in well-lighted areas than uh, in dark areas. Did, did I catch that all now? One, one, right. one, we only have one more question. Is that all right? All right, we're short on time, but we have one last question, and this will be for Stan also. You had mentioned um, uh, nocturnal lighting can affect wildlife, and uh, one of our audience members would like to hear more on that subject. Yeah, uh, well, Don is nodding his head. He might have, <laughs> might have more to say on the subject, but, uh, I, and I'm not sure that, that uh, uh, I, I can say a lot more than I've already said, but, but it, it is a real issue uh, for animals and, and for uh, plants. Uh, I, I've seen uh, trees uh, adjacent to street lights that the whole side of the, the tree is green up until December because it's, it's getting a different message. Uh, and so, well, I, I really don't know what more to say, but it, it is a significant issue, but it's one that an awful lot of people could care less about. It's not impacting them. I don't care about the wimes, you know. Well, there, it's hard to express all the things that light does, right? But one of the things that, that I can give you an example with people and wildlife is something called photoperiodism. And it means how much light is there available in a 24-hour day. And human beings are photoperiodic to an extent. I don't know if you've heard of this, something called seasonal affective disorder. All right, it is a photoperiodic 
change. So in the fall, when the photo period decreases, when day length decreases, a certain proportion of people become clinically depressed. And they spontaneously go out of that depression in the spring when the photo period gets longer. We treat these individuals with light. But if you're a, a hibernating animal or a migrating animal, you also use photo period, except human beings turn the lights on and they change the photo period and they completely screw that up. So the animals don't know when they should be hibernating, they don't know when they should be migrating, they do it inappropriately. Everything I indicated about human organization, its dependence on clock, works on every organism in the planet. So it's not just us that respond to inappropriate light. All the wildlife and plants will respond inappropriately as well. Okay, thank you. Um, for those interested in that topic, the uh, Pennsylvania Outdoor Lighting Council has brought a paper which uh, we will get to the back table there. You can um, meet them at the back table. It's a paper on the ecological consequences of artificial night lighting. Um, so that concludes our um, evening's discussion. I uh, just wanted to mention one more time that a recording of all the presentations will be put online and you'll be able to see it from the league website and probably the Radnor Township website as well. So uh, there are handouts on the table also. <laughs> from the Outdoor Lighting Council, also from the League. <laughs> so thank you everyone for coming. Thank you to our three wonderful speakers here this evening. Appreciate everybody's participation and have a good rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you.